So first, of course, I welcome you all here this evening to the Italian Archaeological School and all of you people in Zoom. So we're still doing, uh, doing things like we are doing this time in hybrid form. And it's good to, uh, uh, to see you all there on the other side of the screen and then on the other side of the screen. And we are going to hear the Finnish Institute's 13th Johannes Sundval lecture this evening. It is not only once that I have, uh, that I have heard people wondering who exactly was Johannes Sundval. And I guess that generally this is not obvious to many, not even to our Finnish colleagues and friends. This evening, this issue will get some lightning onto it, as we have a chance to learn about the man himself this time. We also learn the scholarly context where he worked, and we also learn about his context with the wider academic community in the early decades of the 20th century. Very briefly now, Johannes Sundwall, who was born in, in 1877, and maybe you didn't know which day, today, it's the 15th, 15th of, uh, of November, and he died in Helsinki in uh, uh, 1966. He was a classicist who worked as a professor of ancient history, Roman and Greek literature at the Swedish-speaking University of Orp, Turku, that is, uh, from the year 1921. And he was also a, a docent at the University of Helsinki already from 1907. I'm not going to spend time here talking about this biography, because that, that I leave to our tonight's speaker. But let's just say that Sundval was a very prophetic scholar, publishing studies on a wide field of topics. He's known for his work in the fields of prosopography, textual and philological studies on the New Testament, numismatics, and probably most prominently for his work on linear B and A scripts. The time of his, of his active career was politically, culturally, and socially very turbulent time. And this evening, we'll hear more about the historical contexts, as well as about the social and cultural milieu that played a part in the background of Sundfall's scholarly outputs. This all will be done uh, by Dr. Fredrik Whitley, whom I have now a pleasure to introduce to you. Fredrik is a uh, is historian and a scholar with wide scholarly interests as well. He's got impressive international academic connections and experience. He got his PhD from the European University Institute in Florence in 2000, uh, 2010 and was awarded a Mention Speciale prize for his study, The Western Way, Academic Diplomacy, Foreign Academics and Swedish Institutes in Rome. This study was later quite recently, 2018, published by De Kreuter under the title Western Ways, Foreign Schools in Rome and Athens. Frederick has ever since published widely, both monographs and articles, for example, on the history of and formation of the scholarly archaeological institutes in the Mediterranean, on the role of a Swedish King Gustav Adolf as a patron and mecenate of arts, histor historical and cultural studies, as well as archaeology. He has also worked on the history of the formation of archaeological heritage, for example, in a uh, delightful book, uh, which is entitled Termini, Cornerstone of, uh, Cornerstone of Modern Rome, which was published in 2017. Fredrik has also worked as a visiting scholar in many academic institutions, having stayed for long research periods in both Athens and in Rome. He's also, also uh, been working at the Foundation Hut at Geneva, at New York University, University of St. Andrews in the UK, and the Swedish Institute in Istanbul. He has, over the recent couple of years, carried out significant academic collaboration with the Finnish scholarly institutions. During the years 2020 to 2021, he held the Amos Andersson Fellowship at the Finnish Institute in Rome, and in the course of his current year, he has worked as a research fellow here in Athens at the Finnish Institute at Athens, with awarded a grant to study, among other current research themes of his, the archives of Johannes Sundval, which is housed in Turku, and more specifically at its Swedish-speaking university library at Obu Academy. This is one of the reasons, only one of them, 
Well, we have now the honor to welcome Fredrik Whitling, Whitling to give us this evening's talk with the title Greek Genius in Roman Body, Johannes Sundval, the Grand Old Man of Glass Classical Research in Finland, and the Great Minoan Riddle. Please, uh, the floor and the screen is now yours. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very kind introduction of me and of the topic of tonight's, tonight's lecture. I'll uh, go straight into this and I uh, hope you're sitting tight because it will be a good ride through Finnish classical scholarship and uh, in an international context. But again, thank you specifically for this invitation. It is uh, a joy and an honor to be uh, one of many giving this Sundval lectures, this being the 13th, as was just stated, uh, since the lecture series started in 2006. Particularly interesting to be in Athens this particular year, 2021, as an historian. And uh, 21 also happens to fit quite nicely into various anniversaries uh, related to Johannes Sundval <clears throat> himself. And this talk will focus on him. This was my idea when I was asked to, to do this before I went to Turku, before I went through his, uh, his archive collections, to place his scholarship and his work and his life, to some extent, in historical context. So. It focuses on this Finnish ancient historian and philologist, Johannes Sundvall, and also his role in Nordic networks, let's say, in philology and classical studies in the first half of the 20th century. I would like to start by explaining the provenance of these various quotes in the lecture title. I'll get back to them, actually, throughout, throughout the talk. Greek genius in Roman body. This is a quote from a telegram that Sundvall re received on his 50th birthday. That's what he was called. And this heading, I suppose, could be a, a way of summing up his entire scholarly career. And this talk will uh, fluctuate between Italy and Greece, as you will notice. It will cover Greek and Roman literature, Bronze Age linear writing, A and B, Attic pros prosopography, as we just heard, and also, to some extent, extent social history, Italian prehistory, and Roman history. Second quote, the grand old man of classical research in Finland is what he was also called by, as you will see quite soon, by Torsten Steinby, the first director of the Finnish Institute in Rome. It's, this was an epithet that was a way of honoring him, of course, but also in a way of summing up his position in the academic system. He was, in many ways, an, a pioneer from a Finnish context perspective. As mentioned, he was a docent at the University of Helsinki, from 1907. He was above all professor of ancient history and Roman and Greek literature at Obo Academy University from 1921 to 45. He was also the dean of the Faculty of Humanities there. And as we will see, he was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Athens on the occasion of its centenary in 1937, to which I will return. The last part of the quote of the title, the great Minoan riddle, also refers to uh, a direct quote from the correspondence that I will be referring to soon and covers the last part of this lecture. So I can promise you uh, some uh, interesting material on uh, the decipherment of Linear B as a teaser, let's say, for what's, uh, what will come. So then this image is, of course, of Johannes Sundvall himself, one of the few, one might add, that I've actually managed to find. The topic can be placed in a larger context, in the history of uh, scholarship, the history of archaeology, history of science, and it also, I would like to focus also on uh, what one might say about an individual, the role of individuals in tracing networks in the history of scholarship. Doing this by way of letters, how ideas are transmitted, opinions, worldviews, etc. And this collection of letters that I'll uh, give you several examples from uh, gives conflicting images. We are all complex individuals, of course, but Sundval himself appears to sometimes have been more complex than most. Uh, one <laughs> one might argue, sometimes even conflicting trends uh, and opinions. What I will do is to try to sketch this life in scholarship without passing judgment, as it were. I, I would like to pre present the evidence and then you can uh, make, make your own opinion. It is not a biographical sketch as such, which is, of course, very difficult to achieve, but it is an attempt to try to highlight aspects of his interests and achievements on the receiving end of correspondence. There will be two interesting examples of the other the other direction, let's say, of Sundvall's letters, most importantly to Michael Ventris, which I'll get back to. But what you get here are impressions from his assembled letters and other correspondence. The uh, collection of letters looks like this, 
in Orbu Academy in the library, the manuscripts uh, collection there, another image from the same thing. And I will show you Michael Ventris just as a teaser. This is the man then who famously deciphered the Linear B script. And he did so in a scholarly network that included Johannes Sundval. And this, his contribution to this is one thing that I would like to highlight. And I, I will do so towards the end of this, this uh, lecture. Sundval again. So we might reflect on whether his career was uh, typical or uh, asymptomatic or atypical even in a Nordic or international network in classical studies and philology. The answer is uh, possibly slightly unclear, but I'll get back to that towards the end of the talk. I shall, so to speak, only be able to scratch the symbolic surface here of this man, and I, uh, that's essentially all you can do, arguably, unless you have access to other material. Sundval was born in Nikarlebi, Usi Karlebi, in what was then the Russian Grand Duchy of Finland, in 1877, on this very day, 15th of November, 144 years ago. The date of this lecture is thus chosen carefully. He had a total of no less than nine younger siblings, although not all survived uh, infancy. Just to place the Gulf of Botnia in some perspective here, what you see, this is an old map from about the time he was born, and is, there's also a map of Russia in Europe, stressing the obvious here that Finland at the time was part of the Grand Duchy. It was a Grand Duchy within, within Russia. Another map, a more modern one, where you will, uh, just to point out where we are, Nikolavi is there, Turku is down here, Helsinki is over there, the Orland Islands, Stockholm. That's essentially what you need as a, as a background uh, for the setting. Sundval's father, who, who you see here, Friedrich Wilhelm, was a Swedish-speaking lecturer and school teacher. His mother, Fanny, uh, is lesser known. The grandfather, Johan Matthias Sundval, was a philosopher and university lecturer, so there was definitely an academic context into which he was born. Johannes Sundval was married no less than four times. He married in 1904 to a woman called Helen Kumlin, with whom he had two daughters with Greek-inspired names, Eleni and Marianti. He married again in 1919 to Anne-Marie Heuer, again in 1942 to Christina Müller, and again in 1945 to Edith Kulin. Less than 70 years before his birth, Finland was still the eastern part of Sweden until 1809. And overall, the Swedish language and Swedish laws were maintained during the Grand Duchy period, which lasted, of course, until Finnish independence in 1917. After the capital had moved from Orbu, Turku, to Helsinki in 1812, taking the university with it, and after Finland had become independent in 1917, a new Swedish-speaking university was uh, created in Turku, in Orbu in 1918, Orbo Academy, or Orbo Academy University, as it calls itself. The following year, 1919, Sundval was offered a personal chair, professorship in ancient history at this new institution, and he was promoted to full professor in 1921 and remained there until his re retirement in 1945. Here we see a printed program for his installation as professor, which almost exactly 100 years ago, in March 1922, he gave a lecture on the idea of world peace and antiquity. An image taken by yours truly of the house, or at least the address in which he, where he lived in Turku, uh, quite close to Orbo Academy on the other side of the river, and Sundval himself again. Johannes Sundval is one of the most prominent names in Finnish ancient history research, not least due to the manifold subjects of his research output. As mentioned, he was born into an academic family, and he graduated, continued his studies in ancient languages and classical philology in Helsinki studying with a politically conservative Latin professor, Friedolf Gustafsson, also a champion of the preservation of Swedish in Finland, and the Greek professor, Eva Heikel, who also came from Nikolavi. He took an early interest in historical research and continued his studies in Munich and Berlin, influenced by current research in ancient history and epigraphy. His doctoral dissertation on aspects of the history of Athenian social politics during the fourth century BC, on which he worked in Germany, was based on and inspired by the epigraphist and philologist Johannes Kirchner, whose published inscription in his Prosopographia Attica in 1901 was very influential for him. Sundval sought to prove by way of epigraphical evidence that power was held by the higher classes in society rather than the lower. And the year after his doctoral degree in 1906, he was made a docent, as mentioned in Helsinki in ancient history. He therefore rapidly, thereafter rapidly developed his career as a researcher in Helsinki and abroad. He published his Untersuchungen über die Attischen Minzen des Neueren Stiles, 
all of it's in German, in two volumes in 1907 to 8. He then went to Greece and spent about a year in Greece, primarily in Athens, 1908 to 1909, where he gathered material for a supplement volume to Kirchner's uh, opus. With a stipend from Helsinki, he then traveled to Austria and to Germany and made a trip to Crete, importantly, and to Asia Minor in 1913. He based his work in ancient history on uh, primary sources, epigraphy, coins, papyri, and the like, and uh, was in, that, in this sense one of the first epigraphists from Finland. His research focused on classical Greece and late antiquity, for example, and also Rome, for example, his Westromische Studien in 1915, but also he also took an interest in issues relating to ancient chronology and recording time. Interested also in Asia Minor, as mentioned, and as early as 1911, he published an uh, article on ancient Anatolia and Carian inscriptions and name structures, followed by a rather disputed monograph in 1913 on Lycian and other Anatolian names, but noted for its uh, careful uh, tables. The outbreak of the First World War prevented Sundvall from returning to Finland. He was, as it were, stuck abroad. And he spent most of the First World War in Berlin, where he participated undercover in the activities of the Jäger movement, Jäger Rögelsen in Swedish, in 1914 to 16. That is to say, Finnish volunteers in Germany, whose aim was to liberate Finland from Russia, broadly speaking, advocating German alliances in this endeavor, rather than with, for example, Sweden, as promoted by Mannerheim and other illustrious people in this, at the same time. Here you see an image of Jäger battalion officers in Latvia, then East Prussia. You see its machine gun company, and you see a photograph of the so-called Lokstetter Lager in Schleswig-Holstein, in Holstein, in Northern Germany. These Jäger volunteers became soldiers in the German army and pledged to serve Germany thus became, becoming traitors to the nation, according to Russian and French, uh, French law. This Lokstetter Lager in Holstein, between Hamburg and Kiel, was used for training of this Finnish division. Sundval assisted the Finnish activist uh, Wetterhof in the education of these volunteers. Officially, he was teaching Latin and Greek in a school in Berlin. What he was actually doing was assisting the Jäger volunteers in training the army that was to liberate Finland. There are various uh, uh, traces of this in the, in the archival material, communications from this Berlin section of this uh, Ausbildungstruppe Lokstedt. More than a decade later, he uh, donated documents about this activity in the Jäger Battalion in Berlin to the Finnish state archives, where they can now be found. I'd like to mention a publication by my friend and colleague Ingrid Bay, who in 2019 published an article on the correspondence of Sundval's wife, who was in Finland with their two daughters. They divorced when he came back, basically in 1918, and Sundal remarried the following year. It's an, uh, <clears throat> a nice piece of writing and one of the few <laughs> scholarly articles on Sundal in recent uh, years. After the Russian Revolution then, in the tumultuous situation before the Finnish Civil War, Sundval was also in contact with the Russian Red Cross Committee regarding a passport. It was a, a very complicated time, of course, and he was trying to make his way back to, to Finland, which he also did. He maintained contacts in Berlin with various Swedish-speaking activists and writers in Finland, in this, with the so-called Swedish paper in Helsinki, for example. His scholarly network included, for example, the classical archaeologist Axel Boetius, Swedish, who was engaged in the war in Finland, based at Uppsala in Sweden, where Sundval actually moved for a while after the end of the war. So coming back, he set out to strengthen the position of classical studies in the Finnish academic system. He was not yet professor at uh, Orbo. He received various uh, statements from other academics, uh, stressing the increased need of uh, studying the political, social development in antiquity and the meaning of ancient history in the university system. He also wrote an essay on this topic himself, which re received support from, for example, the Swede Johan Beiman, who was professor of Latin at Tartu in Estonia. So this Nordic network, this Swedish-speaking Nordic network, was definitely not restricted to Sweden. His uh, scholarly network was enlarged after the war, of course, not least in classical studies and philology in Germany. He was, for example, in, in contact with the famous philologist uh, von Wilamowitz Möllendorf and with the historian Edward Meyer during the 1920s. Yet, despite this growing international network and uh, experience and reputation, he was not offered a position in Helsinki, where he was already docent. Instead, as mentioned, he taught at uh, the newly founded Orbo Academy, where he was given this personal professorship and made full professor. 
in Greek and Roman literature. He was congratulated to this by another Swedish guy, <laughs> the Latin professor Wilhelm Lundström, who congratulated him to his professorship, but also strengthening classicity at Orbu. This was important. Just to give you an idea of what Orbu Academy, some of it looks like, including the library, picture from the 1940s. Sundval proceeded to publish on the decline of the Roman world. This is what he did after the First World War, mainly in contact, for example, with uh, the former director general of the Swedish National Heritage Board, Board, Oscar Montelius, famously known for his influential early, middle and late stone, bronze, iron age system of chronological development. Montelius wrote letters to him, reporting, for example, on meetings with Sir Arthur Evans, the archaeologist, of course, famous from Crete. From Crete. They had met in Sweden discussing Crete, and uh, yeah, Montelius reported on this and thanked uh, Sundval for, uh, for his writing on uh, origin of Cretan writing, to which uh, we'll return. Sundval was also in touch with his Greek colleagues. For example, the Greek archaeologist Josip Khatsidakis, who, among other things, had carried out early excavations at Knossos in around 1900. And in 1921, he gave a lecture in Berlin entitled Über die Kretische Schrift, which is not unimportant, and I will return to that eventually. Here you see a postcard sent from another Cretan archaeologist and historian, Stephanos Xanthodidis, in 1921, where he's essentially congratulating him on excellent articles on Minoan writing. The first achievement to work on this difficult pro problem is what is writing on this postcard from uh, the Cali Limines, the good ports in southern Crete encouraging him to continue his work, essentially. His friend Axel Boetius wrote, reminiscing 40 years later, about their time, their travels in Greece, specifically on Crete, saying, referring to a, a trip in 1922, when, quote, everything, including the ice cream, tasted of sheep and goat, unquote. A rather rough and rugged Crete that these, uh, that these young uh, northern philologists were rummaging about him. In 1923, not entirely satisfied perhaps with his position in Finland, he applied for the professorship in ancient history and classical archaeology at Uppsala in Sweden, from which Lennart Schelbe, one of the pioneers in Swedish classical archaeology, was to retire. Schelbe wrote to Sindval in 1922, congratulating him to his professorship at Orbu, but he was, however, in the end succeeded by Axel V. Persson, who you see in this picture, the bust from the Swedish Institute next door who became one of the leading figures in establishing the Swedish Institute during the Second World War. Hence the image of the, the, one of the uh, Swedish Red Cross ships in Greece, which is a totally different story. The main applicants uh, for the Uppsala professorship were Persson, Axel Boetius, who instead became the director of the Swedish Institute in Rome, established quite soon thereafter, and Johannes Sundwald. These three people applied for the uh, professorship. Sundwald was clearly ahead of the other applicants in the field of ancient history, but was, was not recommended by expert reviewers due to his limited experience of classical archaeology and hands-on monument know-how. They didn't mention that he wasn't Swedish, but that was also part of the story. These are small networks, small circles, which will be apparent, I think. In the summer of 1924, Lennart Schelbe, who had just uh, retired from this position in Uppsala, visited the Swedish excavations at Asin which I mentioned because partly because they were co-led by Axel Persson, who got the job in Uppsala, but also as they're about to celebrate their 100th anniversary next year. Shelby, however, was thought that this was far too expensive and far too complicated for Sweden alone to be running this project of, of excavating at Assini, trying to make it a Swedish, Danish, or even Nordic project, um, <clears throat> encouraging Sundval to uh, not keep away as in, please make sure that the Finns might be interested in joining in this Scandinavian, possible Scandinavian venture. I give you an image from the excavations at Lassini and another one um, with um, the Swedish Crown Prince Gustav Adolf as chairman in the Assini Committee, in the uh, Swedish Cyprus expedition and elsewhere, also in the establishment of the Swedish Institute in Rome in 1925, which you see there on your right. Shelbe, and now we're diving deep into Sundwall's archive, prepared him to get involved in, this, in these ventures, as I said. Here you get some, uh, one of many letters from Shelbe to Sundwall, referring to Axel Persson's excavations at Dendra, which were going on in 1927. Going, keeping, uh, keeping our chronology here slightly, in 1922, Sundwall was approached by the so-called German Greek Society, 
inquiring how many Greeks are there in Finland at this time. Yet, Sundval's main scholarly stage, if you like, outside Finland was Germany, German academic and political circles. In 1923, for example, he was in contact with Adolf Mahr, an archaeologist and later Nazi activist, and lamented the current political developments in Europe, possibly with the exception of fascist Italy. I will turn to that. In the late 20s, Sundval contributed a chapter to this on the history of, of the Roman Empire to a Swedish series on global history, Lean Blods Vadsistoria, which was published from 1927 onwards. And all of the usual suspects turn up here. Axel Boetius, for example, contributed to this, and they corresponded about it. Shall we put Augustus, that is to say the murder of Caesar, as a border between us? Question mark. They were discussing how to present uh, ancient history to the Swedish public. In the 20s and 30s, Sundval spent many of his summer holidays in Italy, where he visited significant museum collections, the Etruscan Villa Giulia and Pigurini museums of prehistory in Rome, and the archaeological museums in Bologna and Florence, and so on. And his work on material from the so-called Villa Nova period resulted in his main output on Italian prehistory, employing historical and philological methodologies. He was not trained in either archaeology or art history and focus, for example, on analyzing patterns in pottery decoration and geographical organization of types of material. And this resulted in observations on differences and similarities between different Italic Iron Age settlements and on the relative chronology of objects, as they often lacked archaeological context. His work, The Italian Hitten Urnen, 1925, reached Luigi Pigurini, the grand old man of Italian prehistory, just before he died in 1925. He received letters of thanks from, for example, the German archaeological, archaeological scholarly circles that I mentioned. Gerhard Rodenbart, Secretary General, later President of the German Archaeological Institute, Karl Weikert, one of his successors, and, interestingly, from the philosopher Oswald Spengler, most well-known for his post-First World War work, Der Untergang des Abendlandes, The Decline of the West. He, contributed, he, he agreed with Sundval, but contributed his own uh, theories about prehistoric hut urns from Italy. He made art historical comparisons and similes in schematic thinking about cultural evolution and so forth, very much of his, of his time. Also, the former and later director of the German Archaeological Institute in Athens, Georg Karl, expressed his appreciation of Sundval's work, referring to the schöne Zeiten, the good times that they had had together in Athens in the past. Sundval's mid-1920s work on hut urns on the Italic Peninsula also received uh, acknowledgments from other scholarly contexts, as you might imagine, also from Sweden, from the Crown Prince Gustav Adolf, and from Wilhelm Lundström, the professor that I mentioned before, who nostalgically looked back on earlier work and travels to Italy, stating that we were Trojans, buimus troes, as in we had good times back then, and also from the US, from, for example, the ancient historian Tenny Frank at Johns Hopkins, who added a question in Swedish, <laughs> whether it was still allowed, quote, to speak Swedish in Finnish schools. This is the climate in which we are situated. The title of this lecture, Greek Genius in Roman Body, is taken from this telegram that Sundval received on his 50th birthday from a certain Sigurd Koch. Hel Grekis Snille i Romersk Kopp, Greek Genius in Roman Body. Sundval became a corresponding member of the, the so-called Permanent Committee for Etruria in 1927, and the first International Congress in uh, Etruscan Studies took place in Florence the following year, in which the famous Etruscan problem, that of the origin of the people, language and culture, was addressed, and Sundval's work on Italic prehistory almost inevitably led to him having to take a stand in this question of Etruscan origins and relative chronology, of Etruscan and Villanovan culture, and he didn't agree with the hypothesis that Etruscans migrated to the Italian peninsula from the Eastern Mediterranean, but rather believed that they were an indigenous people, a stance that has seemingly been substantiated only very recently, in fact. He published his uh, Villanova Studien in 1928 and sent a copy to Benito Mussolini, who uh, soon uh, sent a note of appreciation and thanks, which he got from the fascist leader the same year, conveyed by the Italian chargé d'affaires in Helsinki. Oswald Spengler, our friend, all, also returned and expressed his appreciation, although uh, Sundval's work had confirmed to him that the question of Etruscan origins would remain unsolvable, quote, as long as one regards the Etruscans as a unity. He might have had a point. Spengler also wrote to Sundval a few years later about his publication on the emergence of the Phoenician alphabet, agreeing again with Sundval's analysis. Sundval 
was invited to take part in the centenary of the State Museums in Berlin in 1930. The following year, he was approached by the Swedish Institute for Racial Biology, not the proudest moment in Swedish history, as he was approached because he was, quote, a Swede abroad, or, quote, a Swedish descendant in foreign countries. To his credit, however, Sundval appears not to have acted on an appeal to contribute his name and photograph to an exhibition to the Institute's racial collection. But it says quite a lot about the, the climate in which we're operating here. The young Finnish historian Gunnar Mikvits, who was killed in the winter war with Soviet Russia in 1940, corresponded with Sundval in 1931, thanking him for his uh, willingness to recommend him in Berlin. And Sundval, at this period, in this period, followed up his earlier Villanova work with his Sulfurgeschichte Etruriens in 1932. The work was appreciated, for example, by Prince, later King Leopold III of Belgium, who thanked him on a typical postcard of the time, illustrating the isolation of the capital hill in Rome, works of the fascist regime. This is 10 years after the fascist takeover in Italy. The following year, Sundval was appointed a so-called ordinary member of the Istituto di Studi Etruschi in Italy. This is Sundval's signature in a book in the library of the Finnish Institute in Rome, along with the signature of his, probably his brother, Martin Sundval, who died in 1929, which is sort of touching that he added his name to his brother's book, which is now in the Finnish library in Rome. The same year, the year that Hitler came to power in Germany, 1933, Sundval received reports from German-oriented scholarly circles in Sweden. For example, from Lund in the south of Sweden, where the Swedish-Finnish theologist Johannes Lindblom, later principal of Lund University and also professor at Orbo earlier, related to Sundval how, quote, German professors move in dense groups through our city. The clouds were, were amounting, let's say. The following year, and it doesn't get better, I'm afraid, Sundval was thanked for, quote, his willingness to break in the new Germany in your homeland by the Deutsche Akademie in Munich, precursor to today's Goethe Institute. He was also approached by the Swedish pro-Nazi association, some funded Monheim, but uh, seemingly did not accept an invitation to add his name to its foundation document. So he did play some of his cards right in those, uh, in those troubled times. The same year, interestingly, he applied for support from the Rockefeller Foundation in New York in 1934 for a study period in Italy for research in the prehistoric chronology of Italy, but he, he didn't get the money. The suggested field fell outside the competence of the foundation, it was stated in a document. The following year, in 1935, the former emperor Willem II of Germany, who lived in exile in the Netherlands, thanked Zundwald for his contribution to the establishment of, quote, a general chronology of prehistory, unquote, thus sharing in this common wide-ranging cultural historical obsession at the time. Interesting, however, to get such a letter, one might uh, argue. In 1935, Sunva was approached by the Istituto di Studi Romani, which was founded as a regime instrument for the scholarly dissemination of Romanita, Romanus, as a possible liaison for its work in Finland. And his name had likely been suggested by his friend Axel Boetius, who was responsible for the Institute's Swedish section in Gothenburg. Here you see the Institute Review, Roma, and also its director, Galassi Paluzzi, leaving an exhibition with the then Minister of National, National Education. Boetius wrote to Sundval about Galassi Paluzzi. He was impressed by the, his work ethic and energy to realize his ideals in practical terms. Quote, he's become the restless slave to his idea. And his idea was, of course, to spread Roman history, Roman culture in the new Rome of, um, the third Rome of, um, of uh, Mussolini. Such nationalist applications of classical studies fit the bill, unfortunately, at that time of uh, increasingly authoritarian social political structures. And in a similar way, many letters that Sundwald received from Germany in this period ended with so-called German greetings, Deutschen Gruß, and the traditional party salute to the Führer. Sundwald also received and exchanged a sub substantial amount of correspondence with the, the German emb embassy in Helsinki. Here you see an invitation to the 550th anniversary of the University of Heidelberg, uh, and also a letterhead from the Historical Association in Helsinki, because the same year, Sundar was made an honorary member of this historical association for his contributions to the field of historical research. And the same year, again, Sundal was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Athens on the occasion of its centenary, as you can see in this document. 
by its, uh, its rector. He received various gratulatory remarks on his 60th birthday that autumn from, for example, the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin and uh, various other uh, museum sections in Berlin. Here you have Schönwald's dedication at Karistopoli, thank you very much, to Gunnar Mikwitz, the, uh, the scholar that I mentioned before, who was uh, sadly killed in the Winter War on a published lecture in Swedish in 1937. This is from the Gunnar Mikwitz Extracts Collection from the Finnish Institute in Rome, which is an interesting collection for future research, I would argue. 1938 marked the 20th anniversary of the end of the First World War and of the Finnish Jäger Volunteer Battalion in Berlin that I mentioned earlier. And the military attaché at the German embassy in Helsinki corresponded with Sundwald that year regarding celebrations of the Jäger Battalion in Germany. He was also approached to give talks on the background and history of this battalion to various Hitlerjugend groups in Germany on the theme of, quote, Finnish youth as liberators of their country, unquote. This, quote, in order to determine the omnipotence of Jewish capital and to prove how right the cure is that he does everything to free us from it, unquote. This is the climate of the, of the 20th anniversary of the Jäger Battalion and uh, probably quite close to the general atmosphere of the Jäger Battalion itself, arguably. He was also at the same time discussing research collaborations with the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin. Here you see the Hamburger Bus Hotel in Orbu, in Turku, postcard from 1910, and an advert from 2021 <laughs> from, uh, from the uh, Academy uh, magazine. What do you say again? New Dawn, yeah, that's right. By this time, the rot had really started to set in in many German institutes and organizations, institutions. And it's overall fair to say that Sundwald placed most of his eggs in the German Nazi basket at this, in this period, in Germany as well as in Finland. For example, in February 1938, he gave a lecture in German to the Finnish German Society, Finnish Deutsche Gesellschaft in Orbu, on the emergence of the 27th Jäger Battalion in this hotel in Turku, in the Grossen Saal. Sundwald was also the president of the society itself. He had contact with, for example, the German Nordische Verbindungsstelle and the Nordische Gesellschaft Reichskontor in Lübeck and the Deutsche Verein in Obu, Turku. So we're talking about several Finnish-German associations and Sundwald being right in the, in the middle of, the, of this uh, development, let's say. Here you have a, a letter from the Deutsche Verein on the celebration of Hitler's birthday in 1944 and also a sign of the times thank you note with the traditional greeting at the end. Predating the wartime German Archaeological Institute, Institute excavations in Northern Italy in search of Germanic origins and so on, and, and renowned figures from late antiquity such as Frederick the Great, the Reichsbund für Deutsche Vorgeschichte approached Sundwald in early 1937 uh, to, to give a lecture in Berlin on the Nordic origins of the Italic people. Sundwald accepted the invitation and spoke on the theme of Nordic influences in the early Iron Age of Italy. This lecture attracted the attention and appreciation of Karl Theodor Weigel, whom you see here, who led a research program on writing, that is runes, and so-called Sinnbilden, symbols, ideographs, symbols, associated with the Ahnenerbe, the Ancestral Heritage Organization. Association. He was a fan of uh, Sundwald's Villanova work, for example. He was also uh, approached by uh, the Ananaba to contribute to their, their monthly review, which he may or may not have, have done. This was all again symptomatic, unfortunately, of the time of classical studies, Orientalists, and so on, and the, also symptomatic of the peak of nationalist nation building, including the use of the ancient and modern past. Although the, one has to say that the level and frequency of Sundwald's contacts and participation in these networks was unquestionably higher than average, so to speak. His work did seem to attract political attention. Possibly unwarranted, possibly also unwanted, but there it is. The impressions are quite clear based on the available material. After the introduction of racial laws in Italy in 1938, Sundwald received copies of the Italian racial review, La, La Difesa della Razza, The Defense of the Race, from Germany. He was also approached during the war by the monthly racial review Rasse for Nordic Fort, asking him to contribute an essay on Italian prehistory and a, view, a review of a book by Franz Altheim on the Doric wanderings in, in Italy. Altheim also corresponded with Sundwald on the decipherment of Cretan right. Just before the outbreak of the war, Sundwald participated in the 6th International Congress of Archaeology, Archaeology in Berlin, 1939, August, with contributions on early fibula, buckle material from Italy. He received thank you notes, uh, for example, from the art historian, fascist politician, Giulio Giglioli, 
associated with, for example, the Mostra Augustea della Romanità in Rome at the, in the same period. Sundberg communicated with several people, including in this period, including the Finnish writer Johannes Birkvist, who idealized Germany from his vantage point in Berlin. Here you see the founding meeting of the Institutum Romanum Finlandiae, the uh, Finnish Institute in Rome. This was in 1939, in which Sundwald took part. You can see him sitting there somewhere on the right, in the middle. Look for the moustache. This institute was realized 15 years later, in 1954. During the early stages of the war, Sundwald contributed to the freedom movement by giving lectures um, of the Finland Committee in Stockholm. In 1941, the Italian Cultural Institute in Helsinki was inaugurated the same year as the same institute in Stockholm, which was followed by interest, with interest by Sundwald, who corresponded with its director, Roberto Weiss, for more than two decades. Sundwald's magnum opus, however, in Etruscan studies was Die Älteren Italischen Fibel, published by the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin in 1943. I say no more. In the autumn of 1940, Sundwald was given a border laissez passer in order to transport fibula material from Berlin to Finland, which you can see here. He was also offered to stay in the Wormisch Germanisches Kommission in Frankfurt in order to continue these Italian fibula studies. And he was asked at the same time to represent Finland, interestingly, in an <laughs> upcoming festrip for the Danish brewer Karl Jakobsen founder and founder of the New Carlsberg Bibliothek in Copenhagen. Moving on, after the war, Sundwald was informed by the publisher of the, the fibula book, De Greuter, that only a small stock, about 80 copies, had been spared of wartime destruction, the perils of publishing in Berlin in 1943. And during and after the war, Sundwald communicated with Amos Andersson, benefactor of the Finnish Institute in Rome, and assisted Andersson with translations to Latin, for example, of uh, church inscriptions, which he was thanked for very uh, heartily, and uh, also communicated about this rather interesting palindrome inscription in Pompeii that was found in 1930 which he lectured on uh, in uh, Turku and other places. Sundwall also took an interest in research on the New Testament with earlier work in the 1930s, but after his retirement in 1945, he continued teaching, but he retired. He published a monograph in Swedish on the subject Nya Testamentets Ultext, the founding text of the New Testament, 1946. So, the war's over. Sundwall was approached by the German Archaeological Institute in Berlin after the war, as it needed to review its list of members, sending this illustration of the Casa Tarpeia in, in, the, in Rome, the original home of the Institute. Its president, Weikert, wrote to Sundwell, emphasizing that, quote, your research and your name are so closely connected with the scientific reviews of our country, that is in Germany. And in, in 1950, he was invited again to participate in the 250th anniversary of the, uh, the Deutsche Akademie der Wissenschaften in Berlin. After his retirement, he didn't really just uh, sit back and do nothing. He maintained an engagement in, for example, the Rotary International Organization. Somewhat charmingly, as perhaps, he was part of a Finland-Swedish male choir in Helsinki, Selskapet Muntre Musikanten until at least uh, 1947. He also appears to have devoted some time to art in Finland and Sweden, suggesting the purchase of a portrait to National Museum in Stockholm, for example. And he was also elected in this period to lead the so-called Nordenfjell Samfund in Finland for the exploration of, in particular, the archipelago areas of Finland, receiving, for example, funding from Orland's Kultustiftelse, the Orland Culture Foundation. He also received support to go and visit various museum collections in Stockholm and in uh, the former Yugoslavia in the Western Balkans, which resulted in another publication on Balkan fever in 1955. In 50, 1953, he was notified by the Italian legation in Helsinki that he was considered for the distinction Order of the Star of Italian Solidarity, uh, the Stella della Solidarità Italiana, which is quite a big deal. And here you see an illustration of Villa Lante, the Finnish Institute in Rome, a drawing by Le, Le Corbusier, in fact. So as a pre-war founding board member of the Finnish Institute in Rome, he was, Sundwald was very much, much up to date with its establishment, the Institute in Rome on the Gianicolo, and he moved in these rather close-knit uh, Swedish-speaking circles that uh, enabled it. Above all, perhaps Amos Andersson and Thorsten Steinby that I mentioned, its first director and editor of newspaper in Helsinki. Steinby wrote to Sundwall in 54 regarding the inauguration, for which Sundwall was specially invited, and Sundwall appears to have stayed in the Institute the year after, in 1955. And in the year after that, when Steinby defended his doctoral dissertation, he thanked him and referred to the retired professor as, quote, the grand old man of classical research in Finland, hence the quote from, from the title. I will now, for the remainder of this talk, move to Greece. 
having covered Italian prehistory. So moving figuratively, at least, from Italy to Greece, into the great Minoan riddle, as promised in the title, which is a quote from a letter on Minoan writing from Helen Pope to Sundval in 1953. But it's a good, uh, it sort of sums up the, the general atmosphere here. Sundval's other main significant contrib contribution to ancient history and the overall object of his scholarly focus for the rest of his life was in the field of Mycenaean and Minoan writing. The Minoan so-called Linear A clay tablets were discovered on Crete by Sir Arthur Evans and his excavations at the turn of the last century. And after his visit to Crete in 1913, that I mentioned before, Sundval began to join the club of philologists who dreamed of cracking the code. As most of us are perhaps aware of, but still might bear repeating briefly, the linear A writing system was used on Crete from about 1800 to 1450 BC for an hypothesized Minoan language that appears to have evolved independently from the Egyptian and Mesopotamian writing systems. But no texts in linear A, as we know, have yet been deciphered. You see linear A to your left. The only part of the script that can be read with any form of certainty are the numerical value sign. So with Mycenaean domination of the island, linear A was succeeded by linear B on the Simplifying slightly, but uh, you know, an early form of Mycenaean Greek, as it turned out. Linear B shares several symbols of linear A, which remains incomprehensible, as I said, linear A. The term linear, of course, refers to the script being written with a stylus that cut lines into a tablet of clay, which distinguishes it from cuneiform written with stylus to press wedges into clay. And uh, as a, ending this little background, the second millennium BC witnessed four major branches of linear script, which most of you are, I'm sure, are aware of. A, B, so-called Cyprus Minoan, and uh, Cretan hieroglyphic, but we won't uh, get into that right now. Turnbull was happily working away on trying to decipher these uh, clay tablets and was approached regarding a position in Innsbruck in the early 1930s as an authority on Cretan and pre-Greek mainland writing, as it was called. He was an authority not least due to his Die Entstehung des Phoenikischen Alphabets und die Kretische Schrift, in 1931, which was a continuation of his earlier Der Ursprung der Kretischen Schrift from 1920. He then published another work, the Altkretischen Urkundenstudien in 1936, which received attention and thanks again from former Emperor Wilhelm II of Germany, sitting in the Netherlands applauding. He was invited to, for example, Heidelberg to a lecture on the theme of, this, of the Riddle of Minos, and he gave a lecture at the University of Greifswald in the late 1930s on, quote, the problem of the Cretan written system. The Swedish classical archaeologist Nathan Balmin turned to Sundval for expert existence with the character of what he called carved signs from his excavations at Malti in Messenia in the same period in the, in the late 1930s. David Moore Robinson, who had excavated at Olintus and who visited Finland early in 1909, corresponded with Sundval for about a decade after the end of the war. In 1948, Robinson thanked Sundval for his work on the decipherment of, quote, Minoan. It is a problem on which I and several other Americans are working, but we do not seem to really get the solution, end of quote. Robinson and others reflected a widespread view of, quote, Minoan as a unified language or language group. Like many challenges in ancient history and archeology span research, consistently phrased as a problem. Everything is a problem a challenge that had to be faced and solved, preferably universally, once and for all. At the end of the 40s, Sundval was approached by the archaeologist George Milonas, this letter you see here, who had excavated at, for example, Olintus and Mycenae, about a festive for David Robinson, for Robinson's 70th birthday. Here you see a photograph of Alice Koba, a photograph sent to Sundval by her mother, Katharina, after Alice Koba's death in 1950. And in the end of the 1940s, Sundval was in close contact with this American classicist colleague, Alice E. Koba, who also assisted Michael Ventris in deciphering Linear B. Sundval and Koba communicated quite frequently between 1947 and 50, when Koba passed away aged just 43. She had learned a score of ancient languages and modern, and was like Michael Ventris, a linguist with outlandish skills. She also, for example, taught herself Brai, just for the, the hell of it, as it were. In the 1930s, she started studying the Linear B tablets discovered by Arthur Evans and created a massive database of punched, hand-cut cards, up to 180,000 of them. She received a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1946 to, to study Linear B. She made the acquaintance in England of the archaeologist John Linton Myers, chairman of the British School of Athens, known for his excavations on Cyprus. And Sir Arthur Evans, who had passed away in 1941, had entrusted the whole lot, the Bronze Age tablets, from his excavations with Myers. 
So Myers and Cobra were collaborating quite early. Cobra hand copied Evans Linear B inscriptions while she was at Oxford, and she made the major discovery that Linear B was an inflected or fusional language, that is to say one morpheme denoting multiple grammatical features. Her own work was however slowed down by taking on the proofreading and correcting of Myers' work, Scripta Minoa, published in the early 50s. Here we have a letter from Sundval for a change to Korba. So here you, here you get Sundval's handwriting. This one happens to be in English. There are two other available in German. He wrote to her, complimenting her on a wartime article in the American Journal of Archaeology and asked to collaborate with her on deciphering linear A and B. He was impressed with the, with the young lady, as it were. What he called, quote, as you can see, the most intricate problem that is met with in the ancient history, unquote. Quote again, it is a task that requires painstaking accuracy and collaboration of other scholars. I hope for collaboration on the Minoan interesting and difficult problem of decipherment. Unquote. And sure enough, collaborate they did, and uh, Koba translated an essay by Sundval into English on uh, Linear B and sent him a sign list and other things. I shall end this talk with Michael Ventris. Here you see him again. The architect and philologist Michael Ventris, whose interest in the ancient Mediterranean started as a boy when he studied Egyptian hieroglyphs and was seemingly sparked by an exhibition of Minoan artifacts in London that he attended at the age of 14. By chance, interestingly there, he met the then 86-year-old Sir Arthur Evans at this exhibition. And Evans was impressed with this young boy's already fluent command of French and German. Ventris was, in a word, a brilliant linguist. In 1949, at the age of 26, Ventris wrote to Johannes Sundwald. And uh, true to his eventual reputation and as a linguistic prodigy, he wrote to Sundwald in Swedish, thanking him for quote, four pamphlets and acknowledging that he had failed overall with an interpretation of the linear writing in an early article in the American Journal of Archaeology, 1940. Quote, I now admit that the problem, if not hopeless, is much more complicated than one would have thought at the age of 17, unquote. Later the same year, Ventris sent Sundval a copy of a circular letter on various language details with a number of general questions, such as what is the original meaning of the term Pulaskian, asking for Sundval's opinions, which he duly got. And Sundval and Ventris then was part of an international group of scholars by then that included the German Ernst Grumach, the British, as I mentioned, John Linton Myers, and the American Emmett L. Bennett Jr., for example. Ventris followed up this circular letter with another missive in 1950, in which he emphasized that the picture would be rather more complete if we had something from yourself. And a month later, he wrote again to Sundval in Swedish about Alice Koba, expressing concern for Koba's health. I fear that she is ill. That would be a shame, as her opinions would be of particular interest. At the same time, Sundval received correspondence from the German philologist Ernst Sittig, as you can see here, on the decipherment of the linear writing, with Sittig's results and his tables handwritten. He was getting closer, slowly but surely. At about the same time, in 1950, the Swedish linguist Jalmar Frisk thanked Sundval for, quote, your latest interesting contribution to the interpretation of the mysteries of Knossos, unquote. Ventris again, this quote, which is rather lovely, from the spring of 1950, a nice quote, he wrote again to Sundval, this time in English, seemingly optimistic overall about the likelihood of solving what has been referred to in the title of this lecture as the great Minoan riddle. Quote, as you can see, I too have sometimes felt, not entirely in jest, that there must be some sort of spell, or as the Americans would say, a hex, on the successful reading of the Minoan scripts. Let's hope there's some way of breaking this spell, which the apparently happen to be. These are examples of uh, the correspondence from Ventris to Sundval and of his handwriting. Other specialists, for example, from Turkey, wrote to Sundval at the same time about Cretan Minoan writing. And a month later, Sundval in 1951 received this holiday or winter holiday postcard from Ventris from the Matterhorn, the Alps. Ventris wrote to Sundval again a month and a half later, once again in Swedish, as you can see here, thanking him for his Klein Asiatische Nachträge and submit, submitted also a table that shows, quote, the distribution of the pilot signs and their typical positions within words, referring then to an index that had been made by Emmett Bennett. Sundwald's Klein Asiatische Nachträge was distributed to the Ecole Française, the American School Libraries in Athens, and so on, 
And concurrently, interestingly, as a slight little parenthesis, Emil Kunze, the director of the German Archaeological Institute here in Athens, approached Sungwald regarding a list of damaged and destroyed books in their institute library, which only in July that year had been returned to German administration, 1951. He wanted some of Sungwald's work. Could you please send some crates of books, please, which he, which he did. Back to Ventris who wrote to Sönval again in the summer of 51, thanking him for his, quote, kind comments on work note 11 and for the copy of another of the Sönval's publica publications. At the same time, Sönval was uh, invited to Denmark to take part in a colloquium in Copenhagen in 51 on, uh, quote, the original Indo-European home. Eventually, Ventris cracked it. So, <laughs> here you have uh, this uh, an excerpt from a letter to Bennett uh, where he where he lays it out, as it were. He was he famously cracked the Linear B code, so to speak, in 1952. And as we know, Linear A enigmatically remains to be resolved. Shortly uh, after this breakthrough discovery that the inscriptions were in fact prehistoric Greek, Ventris announced it to the world on BBC Radio. And one of the listeners was the philologist John Chadwick, an expert in early Greek who heard Ventris on the BBC immediately contacted him and offered to collaborate on the decipherment of the, of the linear tables. And if technology is with me, we shall hear Ventris for a short while, about one minute, explaining this on the BBC. For a long time, I too thought that Etruscan might have formed the clue we were looking for. But during the last few weeks, I've suddenly come to the conclusion that the Knossos and Pylos tablets must, after all, be written in Greek a difficult and archaic Greek, seeing that it's 500 years older than Homer, and written in a rather abbreviated form, but Greek nevertheless. Once I made this assumption, most of the peculiarities of the language and spelling which had puzzled me seemed to find a logical explanation. And although many of the tablets remain as incomprehensible as before, many others are suddenly beginning to make sense. As we expected, they seem to contain nothing of any literary value, but merely record the prosaic and often trivial details of the palace administration. We have lists of men and women, for instance, where each name has the person's trade next to it, and we rediscover familiar Greek words like poimen, shepherd, kerameos, potter, kalkeos, bronzesmith, chrysogorgos, goldsmith. Some of the persons have longer descriptions, like so-and-so, a goat herd watching over the quadrupeds belonging to so-and-so, or three waitresses whose mother was a slave and whose father was a smith, or stonemasons for building operations. So it goes, it goes on. It's a lovely little clip. You can find it on, uh, on YouTube. Chadwick was over the moon about this, wrote to Ventris. Ventris agreed to collaborate with him, and more or less at the same time, interestingly, the American archaeologist Carl Blegen discovered a new collection of Linear B tablets at mainland Pilos. Blegen was then immediately included in this uh, already established group, uh, the collaborators, let's say. Here you have the, the so-called tripod tablet from Pilos, one of the most famous Linear B inscriptions discovered in 1952. So at the same time as Ventris had, had, was cracking the code, this material came to light. And in this, at the same time, again, <laughs> Helmut Bossert, who was a director of the German Archaeological Institute in Istanbul, wrote to Sunval about Ventris' discoveries and his own excavation work at Karatepe in southern Turkey, the Hittite fortress, where the Karatepe bilingual inscription was discovered earlier after the war, a so-called Rosetta Stone, if you like, for the decipherment of the hieroglyphic Luvian. So many breakthroughs, ha breakthroughs happening here at the same time. The director of the Swedish Institute of Athens, Orkestrum, wrote to Sunval a month later, also about Ventris' discoveries. He, however, found the fact that, uh, quote, one had found Greek language also in Knossos, peculiar, and he asked Sundval for further information. Orchestrum thanked him for details on Ventris' works and wrote to him about Karl Blegen being in Athens and congratulated Finland to its beautiful institute in Vila Land. So Sundval was, in other words, widely considered an authority in the field here. A few years later, the classical archaeologist Arne Fugermark, Uppsala, thanked him for just acknowledging, acknowledging Fugermark's research in attempts to decipher Minoan, Minoan Linear A writing. A year before he died in 1954, John Linton Myers, the British archaeologist I mentioned earlier, wrote to Sundval about lectures that Ventris was to give in Oxford and London and added that Ventris was in correspondence with Sir, Sir Arthur Evans. And I have been in correspondence with him since I came into possession of Evans's papers. So Myers 
was inherited Evans's material and co corresponded directly with, uh, with Ventris. Throwing in, just before the end here, a couple of other names for you. The British linguist and philologist William Bryce, later professor in Near Eastern Studies, devoted much of his scholarly life to work on the Linear A and Linear B scripts. He was more or less the same age as Ventris, a young man. They've got to know John Myers in 1939. And when Myers passed away in 54, Bryce took over the work that he had begun on the corpus of Linear A inscriptions, on the condition that Ventris would assist him. So you have this collective enterprise with now John Chadwick, Emmett Bennett, uh, the linguist Maurice Pope, and other scholars. But Bryce was also in contact with Johannes Sundvall. The grand old man in Finland was still kicking, as it were. In 53, Sundvall published the article Austen Rechnungen des Mykenischen Palastes in Pilos. Ventris, Chadwick, and others produced the work Documents in Mycenae in Greek, but famously between 53 and 56, establishing their case that Linear B was a written form of Greek used by the Mycenaeans and Minoans from around 1450 BC onwards, making it today Europe's oldest known written language. In 54, Ventris sent Sundval a handwritten list of the unpublished tables of 52 from Pilus, adding that this was, quote, quite confidential for the present. This is how it went, handwritten form. And the following spring, Ventris informed Sundval that Bennett and I have now come to agreement on a numerical reference for the Mycenaean ideograms. So after cracking the code, the material was being organized. We have a letter here from John Chadwick to Matti Sainio in Uppsala in the 1980s explaining that he had ventrices. This is what I'm essentially giving is also a history of the history of scholarship here. Who, who gets to inherit what material? Uh, Chadwick inherited ventrices correspondence. And in that correspondence, there were two letters from Sundval to Ventris, only two, whereas several exist from Ventris to Sundval. Only two letters have uh, seemingly been preserved then as copies. In January 54, Sundval wrote to Ventris about using his transcription system. And as you can see, he wrote to him in Swedish. Starts with dear sir, and then, uh, and then keeps going in Swedish, as you do. In April 55, the year after, Sundval thanked Ventris for having sent, quote, your standard table of the Minoan Mycenaean ideograms in numerical order. Unquote. He mentioned, however, that their opinions differed in some cases, and that he was doing his best to keep afloat with, quote, the rich corpus of literature that has arisen. And interestingly, in his letter, added that somewhere a central institute should be created for this research. Shortly after the war, I'm quoting, I suggested to Miss Cobra some museum in America, beyond the reach of bombs and destruction, and a planned center in Philadelphia. Northern, Central, and Western Europe are far too unsafe in case of war, where will one be able to organize such an institute, he asked. And he concluded by adding that uh, he, among other things, had, quote, substantial correspondence that could be of interest to the history of my known research, unquote. That is the very material and theme that I've touched upon in this, uh, in this lecture, and which is just sitting there waiting for more work being done on it. I'm nearing the end. In the summer of 56, uh, Orke Orkestrom, the Swedish director in Athens, again contacted Sundval about the decipherment of the Linear B, and also about the arche archaeologist Nikolaus Platon, the director of the museum in Heraklion, who was in charge of all Cretan archaeological sites from the war until 62, and encouraged Sundval to send some of his work to the museum in Heraklion, which he proceeded to do. So again, an example of these people being in contact with each other, influencing each other, uh, encouraging each other. Sundval was then, so to speak, a grand old man, not only in Finnish circles, but also in the rather close-knit network that con constituted the echelons of the linear writing research community. Its youngest star, Michael Ventris, was, however, its most renowned figurehead. And in late August 1956, Ventris wrote to Sundval what turned out to be one last time, thanking him for an off-print and acknowledging that, quote, we still differ in some points, unquote. A week later, 6th of September, Ventris was dead. He died in a car accident, aged only 34. You have a rather bad quality photograph of uh, Ventris Street in uh, Iraklion, in Crete. William Bryce wrote to Sundval in the summer of 58 about the Linear A script that had been entrusted to him after John Myers' death, and also about a publication, and this is a slight tribute to the fact that we're in the Italian school in Athens, of Doro Levi. This room in which we're in is named after him. Director of Italian School of Archaeology in Athens. He wrote to him, Bryce wrote to Sundval about ceilings from Ayatriada, close to Festos, 
famous for its unique sarcophagus find, with the pictures of my, my own life and death and so on, and about excavations that had been carried out by the Italian mission on Crete in the early 20th century, predating the establishment of the Scuola Italiana. Bryce also informed Sondval about uh, the rediscovery of a hitherto unpublished libation type table from Paleocastel in eastern Crete, for example. So after Ventris's death, these, uh, these people quite, well, not surprisingly, continued. And the same year witnessed Sundval's best shift, having contributed to so many others, finally he got his own, the Minoika, as you can see here, the cover of, and also dedication, a quote, a nice quote by Goethe, and also rather bad photograph of the, the first sentences of, of Chadwick's contribution to the pet script that uh, underlines uh, Sundval's uh, contributions and importance. William Bryce's work on compiling a corpus of linear A took six years to complete, published in 1960. And this led to him being asked to edit the Cadmos Review and contribute, he contributed to bringing this into the field of Near Eastern scripts and the review contributed significantly to the later decipherment of Carrion by the British Egyptologist John D. Ray. So, Johannes Sundval then was indeed a prolific and productive writer with more than 170 titles to his name. Much of his scholarly corpus was published in German, as you've already surmised, he also produced about 200 entries to the Mammoth Encyclopedia Project in Classical Studies, the Pauli di Sova, the Real Encyclopedie of Tumswissenschaft, and wrote many reviews, etc. He was also, to the end of his life, kept as jour with, uh, with Cretan studies, as it were, and the planning, in this case, of the first International Congress in Cretan Studies in 1961-62. One, possibly the last time, Sundval returned to Germany, to Berlin, in 1963, at the age of 85 invited by the Deutsche Akademie der Wissenschaften again for the 110th anniversary of the Corpus Inscriptionum Latinarum collection of Latin inscriptions. And one can't help, or at least I can't help, wondering what the grand old man Sundwall made of East German Berlin and the DDR almost two decades after the end of the Second World War and his retirement. He received, uh, as usual, an appreciative letter from the German Archaeological Institute, 64, thanking him for shipment of a book, but also uh, his book became a reminder of Sundwall's visit to Germany, which was much appreciated. And one of the last letters in his extensive collection from 1966 is perhaps fittingly, given the introduction to the lecture, concerned a possible translation into Finnish of his 1919 book on the Jäger Battalion in German, full circle. So this translated into Finnish from Swedish by on the Werner Service Ernst Verlag in, um, from 1966 onwards. And the time, perhaps, was ripe to begin to discuss this uh, to many difficult episode of Finnish internal strife, civil war that uh, came out of Finnish independence, and so on. In his reminiscence of days in Greece 40 years earlier that I mentioned before, in a letter to Sundval from 62, Axel Buetius addressed how he had, was returning to Greece in terms of research after all my Roman years, and that, quote, all my Greek points of departure have remained as something absolutely alive in my memory. And this quote that I will now read, I find quite interesting. This whole idea that uh, in classical studies you have to choose between Italy and Greece, essentially, I, I think Sundval is, uh, is an excellent example of the fact that you clearly don't. His career encompassed uh, both cultures and much more. But Axel Buetius uh, wrote then, looking back on his life, that I believe that this Greek start of mine before going to Rome really has made a difference to my tuition in Rome as a teacher and has averted the silly opposition between Rome and Athens that is a tradition, if not a hereditary sin, at many institutes in both Athens and Rome." Unquote. This observation, I would argue, has not, has not lost much of its punch today, almost um, 60 years later. Which is concluded by acknowledging that Sundval was, quote, among those who have kept the Minoan alive at the same time that he had guided me in prehistoric Italy and among the last Romans, unquote. Johannes Sundval passed away in the summer of 1966, at the age of 88, nearly two decades before a Finnish institute was established in Athens in 1984, and exactly 40 years before the Finnish institute's lecture series was created in 2006, to which I'm pleased to have been able to contribute. And through these Sundval lectures and in its scholarly achievements, Johannes Sundval's multiple legacies live on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederick. But thank you very much for this extremely informative 
lecture was really shed the light on the man. And that as we see that that we we we, we see here which you so beautifully illustrated for us in words and also also uh, in these pictures and from the archives, would say you personally think that hasn't been looked at before, maybe ever. So there we are. We could see that there's we we have a brilliant scholar. We know of his uh, his work as a scholar, as he uh, as he was. We read of uh, of his uh, scholarly production. Quite often, we can extract the person also from the from the context. We are equally situated as he was. At the same time. We may feel very uncomfortable with the certain issues that 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 we we heard of a Sunfall's personal uh, context where he was working, and even even some disturbing factors, even something that we might might find almost a bit alarming. I'm going to ask you one question here, which concerns you for for us also to you as a historian, you guessed this uh, this uh, this question already. But your opinion as a historian, how much? We do have a responsibility to also take the context of the production into account because this is done quite a lot. There's two ways to react. Sometimes the, even the names are taken off, the statues pulled down. Uh, and so, so, as a historian, how do you find this riddle between the person and the production? Yes, thank you. That's uh, an excellent and uh, enormous question. And, uh, Essentially, I don't believe in censorship, and I think what I try to do here is present the evidence as it is. And uh, it's it's also a case of uh, what material is available to study a certain period. In this case, he presumably allowed his letters to be present in the archives, including all this stuff from the 1930s, which is a bit more compromising that I've mentioned. It's a very complicated issue, but I, the, there was a quote from somewhere which I can't quite remember now, but I, I may even have come up with myself. But <laughs> the fact that uh, this idea that science is not political, that I think a lot of scholars might want to believe, is simply um, untrue. That uh, even, even, de even denying that becomes a political statement. We, we, whatever we do, we operate in a social, uh, social political, social, cultural, context, including research. We can't help which times we're born into, but we, uh, and we don't necessarily need to judge people too quickly on choices they made, which is definitely not my intention here. It is, there is a striking, there is a difference between perhaps of, I mean, he was not alone, of course, in being, I, I was trying to give an image of the sign of the times in the 1930s. Many people had uh, similar inclinations and it was rather helpful that, that these uh, fascist regimes in, in Italy and Germany promoted classical studies. That was rather helpful for many classical archaeologists. So it's a matter of how, how much are you going to protest when, when things are, in research-wise, going your way and so on. So one, one should be careful in passing judgment too, too soon. But there is a difference between that and being the president of the Finnish-German Gesellschaft in uh, Turku, for example. So he, he definitely took it a few steps further, let's say. But uh, we are all uh, complex individuals, uh, truism, of course. But uh, yeah, I think the answer is to try to keep two things in your head at the same time. <laughs> it's something difficult. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that this is actually quite important discussion. It is now for us to, to thank Frederick very warmly for this, uh, this yeah, wonderful course, lecture. And uh, because I, is it is it's these days that uh, you you have brave you who have bravely made your way here to the Italian Institute to listen to this lecture. I am, for my part, happy to welcome you to have a, a little evening bite with us if, uh, after this this lecture. And then for you, everyone there on uh, on on Zoom, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Thank you for for listening about Johannes Sundval uh, to for us to return maybe next year in a different circumstance, historical circumstances, when we have our 40th suitable lecture. So thank you again. <clears throat> thank you. I, I will add one thing. Uh, as okay. you know, I would encourage people to use this, this archival material for, for further research. It is, it is a, one of many treasures, but it is, as you say, one that has hardly been used by anybody. And uh, so just learn Swedish and off you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.